Uh, good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting of the Police, Fire and Rescue Subcommittee. And for the people who don't know, I'm substituting for Dougie Carmel Day in chairing the meeting because Dougie is a bit unwell and he's cleared his diary for his week for the week. So hopefully he'll be feeling better and he gets a speedy recovery. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded and will be made available for viewing through our council's website. Can I remind members to follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off their video when you're not addressing the meeting. Those of you attending virtually who wish to contribute to any item, you'd like to speak in the Teams chat function and you'll be invited to speak in order about new issues. If your question or issue be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we deal with the business as efficiently as possible. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by a roll call. If any, any member has to leave the meeting for any reason, can I remind you that either leave the team's meeting for that period of time, or you could write leave in the team's chat function, then join. This is required to, to allow us to record members' presence, and please do, do not use the chat function for any contributions that are material to debates. We have, we have a couple of important reports to consider the day and anticipate we will deal with the business in a most usual effect, efficient manner. manner. Sedent and apologies and Chair's approval. Uh, Tracy, can you provide the sedent and apologies, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. We've got nine members present. We've got eight members on Microsoft Teams participating virtually and one member present in the Council HQ at English Street, which is Councillor Willie Scobie. And we've got two apologies from Councillor Dougie Campbell and Councillor Chatteris. Thank you, Tracy. And I also, in my role as Chair, approve of members' remote participation. Item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of interest that they wish to make? Minutes of previous meeting, 3rd of June 2021. Can we note that the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of June 2021? Happy to note, Chair. Thank you. Item four, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Dumfries and Galloway Local six-month plan performance update, 1st April 2021 to 3rd September 2021. Report by Head of Governance and Assurance. Area Commander Craig McGoldrick, Local Senior Officer of Dumfries and Galloway, is here to assist if members have any questions on the local plan for the six-month performance update from 1st April 21 to 3rd September is there anything you'd like to add, Craig, before we open the meeting up? Thank you, Chair. Uh, nothing in terms of adding any context to the, the report. Hopefully the paper in the, the format that's now being provided provides that narrative across the various sections. Uh, I'm conscious this is not the first time that I've attended scrutiny and made reflections back on the period of time that we've just come through in terms of COVID, uh, and they are clearly still having a degree of impact on my figures. But uh, hopefully that will be reflected in the, the additional narratives to allow members to give us the scrutiny that's required. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Craig. Is there any members' questions for Craig? Councillor Howie? Morning, Craig. It's not really a question uh, in the report, it's just a general observation. Uh, regarding the call out procedures, obviously uh, with the concerns and the pressure that's put on the ambulance service to say on a lot of occasions, the first emergency response in the boat areas will be your staff. And I'm thinking the likes of the Glen Cairns. Is it still uh, a requirement for an appliance to have four members on before it will be dispatched? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Chair, through yourself, uh, in response, yes, we, we yes would be the short answer. We are still working to uh, a safe system of work, if you like, for operational activity, uh, and that determines that we require four individuals for the, the various types of incidents that we could be asked to respond. Uh, I completely understand your, your point regarding the, the pressures on partners and how, therefore, we might find ourselves at a, a wider range of incidents. A number of the, the things that we're doing to support that is what we're currently 
uh, signposting and seeking volunteers on behalf of the Scottish Ambulance Service and providing additional time and support to undertake driving courses, which would allow them to, to supplement numbers from agencies like ourselves, where we've got that degree of experience of driving under, under blue light. So there, there is a number of support mechanisms that are over and above how we respond, but in terms of our safe systems of work for the, the requirement that they may be redirected to fire as a, a primary resource at any time, they, we still require that crews attend and turn out with four. I wonder if we can just go back to what Craig, you were saying uh, per incident as opposed to staff per appliance. Uh, for instance, in the Glen Kent area, if there was, say, an RTC and you were attending, knowing that there was a, a crew coming from Castle Douglas to come and back up the original crew, uh, would you still be required to, uh, as I say, not so much stand down, but not deploy uh, the new gallery crew? I'm not entirely sure that I'm, I've either come across it correct in the first instance or fully picked up your, your point. All we're applying to would have to be mobilised with a crew of four, so it wouldn't be a collective number, it would be per station, per safe system of work for each of the responding crews. Uh, so that would determine that it would be four as a minimum leaving from any station, much to do with, uh, as I highlighted, the, the potential for redirection. Uh, whilst they might go out to one particular instant type, there's nothing to say that we wouldn't then be redirected to another once we've mobilised from station. So it, it's it's not the collective numbers that we expect to see on the instant ground. It's the safe system of the appliance leaving the station at any given time. No, thanks, Greg. That covers it. Thank you. Quite happy that, Ian and I. Yes. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, good morning, Craig. I'm, I'm not sure if it's you or uh, Carl or both of you. Um, and I'm kind of being a wee bit opportunistic here. Uh, there's a fire alarm has been ringing right next door to me now for 10 days um, that both the fire service and the police have been aware of, but there's nothing they can do about it. And what I'm trying to find out, because it's, it's an empty property, an ex-commercial, but then bought as a house. Um, the question really, though, I'm talking about is in preparation for all the houses in the country going having fire alarms installed as of... Was it February next year or something like that? An operational from early, early spring. Uh, what, uh, what 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 asks of you of the Scottish government, for example, in terms of legislation to enter the premises so that you can actually switch off uh, alarms that are clearly faulty? Because um, uh, my understanding uh, from both your officers and the police, um, as it currently stands, they don't have a power of entry for that. Uh, I I think it's it's probably a, an un, unintended consequence. So. I, a well-intentioned piece of legislation that's not been quite thought through, but I'd be interested in your, your views on that. Thank you, Councillor. And again, through yourself, Chair. Uh, whilst you, you do make two very good points, that there is indeed uh, a change of legislation coming in in February 2022, uh, which is related to fire and smoke alarms in, in Scottish homes uh, and domestic dwellings. That was a piece of work that has really come off the back of the Scottish Government interventions following Grenfell Tower fires in London in 2017. The the point you raise about your your own uh, neighbour and an alarm going off that the legislation that would apply to that has has always been for us in terms of the fire and rescue service who are powers of entry, uh, but we have to suspect that there's a fire. So the the activation of a a detector which has gone for a period of time. Uh, we may well generate our attendance, but we would take the clearly the proactive step of examining from external, looking through letter boxes, a real low-level uh, methods of inquiry, if you like. But it wouldn't be for us to start uh, knocking doors in, I suppose is a, a phrase that we would term, to, to deal with a alarm or to remove the alarm from the ceiling if there's no sign of fire. So that would be the legislative part. The, the terms of what we expect to see going forward come 2022, that is uh, Scottish Government legislation, like I say, and it can be uh, explored further on their, their website. But we are taking up a number of roles as a fire and rescue service to try and support, and our home fire safety process will continue to extend to those that are the most vulnerable who don't have uh, a set of working smoke detectors or indeed the smoke detectors that will be compliant. 
we'll look to identify and assess if they are high risk, and then we can provide some support in the, the fitting of those particular uh, detectors. All other homeowners will be expected to be made aware of the legislation which we will support with and, and their compliance. Uh, hopefully that addresses your, your points, Councillor. Uh, um, I, I think it does, uh, Davey, if you give me just a bit of latitude. Um, the, it, it's an absentee landlord situation and the, the county's riddled with it. So, you know, I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to do here is find a way that we can actually minimise the, your involvement, no maximise, I would suggest. Um, so, and I was just wondering if the Fire and Rescue Service had made any representation to the Scottish Government. Uh, um, it might be that uh, this committee might have to, for example. You know, um, it's it's just a way forward because uh, the old false alarm good and tense all very, all very well if there's somebody there to turn it off. But if there's nobody there to turn it off, um, it then becomes a source of great annoyance to a lot of people for a long period of time, especially if they're, they're connected to electricity rather than um, by battery. So um, uh, thanks very much, and, and by the way, thank your you know, your team for everything they've done over the over the last well, well from time immemorial, shall we say, but especially over the last period. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Just to build on, I think Craig, you may have answered the question, but it's really around, and that, that's to do with the smoke alarms and the legislation that comes into force. I think it's in February uh, 2022. Uh, that all uh, homes must be fitted with these new uh, smoke detectors, either directly into the main system or by battery. When you say you give advice, is this only to vulnerable and elderly, or is it available to everyone throughout the, the, the region uh, so that they can get advice on how they approach this and what they've got to do to, to get these smoke alarms uh, fitted? And my other question is on road, the, under your road safety, under page 13, where you refer to the road traffic collisions and you make reference uh, to the M74 and the M75. Uh, I just wonder if you've got any uh, further detail on the actual numbers. Number of casualties and fatalities uh, alongside the, the, the number of RTCs that you attend. And if you do uh, put this information through to the Scottish Government on the, the number of times that the fire service have to uh, attend, uh, perhaps in support of the upgrading of the 75. I notice you don't mention the 77, but I would believe that's because you've only got about nine miles of the 77 in the region. And then, uh, I take it there'd be very few that you'd be reporting, but still would have that within your remit. So it's just what representations you, uh, you do make to the Scottish Government in terms of the need for this road to be upgraded with a number of casualties and fatalities alongside uh, the fire alarm systems. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so if I, if I take your, your initial question, Again, the, the most vulnerable category is where we would ensure that we are absorbing the costs and fitting the smoke detectors. Absolutely, everybody will get the, the advice and we will continue to use our home fire safety programme and our access and our signposting and our we're able ability, if you like, to use everything from social media and partner engagement to, to share those messages. Uh, the types of alarms, you're absolutely right. Again, they are it's an option whether that's a, a fully wired or a, a Wi-Fi system, which is generated uh, through radio frequencies through battery-operated detectors. And again, there is a list of uh, the, the British standards, etc., that are required to, to meet the requirements of the legislation. And whilst that is hosted on the Scottish Government website, you will see on all of our en engagements, our forward-facing websites uh, and intranets and, and messaging that we're now providing that that detail is is also there for, for individuals to use. Uh, in terms of the road safety, uh, members will be aware that the road safety is actually a new priority which we have brought into our plan because of the, the role that we see that we, we play as a, a fire and rescue service and indeed as a partner within the road safety partnership. Uh, currently, it's still fire safety who take on the, the roles of, of chairs. Uh, we absolutely make representation both internally and externally, and that's through our 
our various our partnership approaches were were adoption and were delivery against the uh, road safety framework 2020 to 2030, uh, and again for the the elements where we're we're constantly reviewing figures based on, uh, if you like, the the number of casualties that, that we see in this type of incident. Absolutely, the, the probably the, the reason that there is that greater focus on the the A75, the M74 is based on our casualty figures. And that, again, shows us that that's an area of risk where we, we put some from real focus on. And it is, it's not to dismiss the A77, but you're absolutely right about the, the short uh, mileage, the, the distance that actually sits within the region, which probably doesn't reflect the, the number of or activity that it has across the, the whole length. And that would be picked up by our, our colleagues and our neighbours in, in Ayrshire. In terms of our, our casualties, uh, hopefully you can see on page seven of the actual report, and that's by my numbering rather than the, any documentation that's been provided for today, because apologies, I, I don't have that, and I, I'm conscious that there may be a, an over-numbering process, but the, the road traffic collisions uh, by number, seven in Annandale and Estale, 10 in Annandale North, they are then broken down into the total number of casualties. So we have shown that year to date as 31. But absolutely, Councillor, I can break that down further for you and, and share that information. Uh, the RTC casualties are broken down by ward uh, as well. You have that total number, but that clearly doesn't show you which ones were on those roads. So that's the piece of work that I can provide for you. Thanks, Craig. No, 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 that's great to hear that, that you do make that representation to the Scottish Government. Uh, and it's, you know, if it could be added, I don't know if it's you or the police that would do it in terms of the number of, ti the number of times the actual A75 and, uh, and A77 are closed because of a, a, a result of a, an, R, uh, an RT, a road traffic accident or, or a collision. Uh, just on the Smoke uh, detector, smoke alarms, when you say you put it out to social media and so forth, I, I think it would be worthwhile to consider all the local papers because uh, I've not seen any, and that doesn't mean to say because I'm not a great hand with social media, uh, uh, how it works and all websites and everything else, but if you could consider local papers, because uh, there could be a number of old people out there that just are at a loss. Uh, and don't know that you provide that type of service and, and, and would fit that for them. So I would ask that you consider that as a, as a means of getting information out there. Craig. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. I'm, I'm happy, happy to consider. We're just very mindful that we're not the owner of the legislation or the enforcement, and it's uh, been very mindful of, of the messaging that comes with that. Uh, we, are not, we haven't brought this in as a Scottish Fire and Rescue Service but we are trying to work with Scottish Government to make sure any funding that's available, we are playing a role in making sure that we, we do target and support those that are deemed the, the highest risk or the most vulnerable. You happy with that, Willie? Yeah, just think, you know, maybe if we could share some of that, to, uh, putting it out there to the media, the, the local papers that the fire and service are there to, to, to assist where we have vulnerable elderly people. If we can work out some system of getting that information out, Davy. Right, Willie. Hey, Councillor Blake. Can he hear you? David, I, I couldn't hear you. I didn't hear you were calling it. Your, your signal broke uh, when you were obviously calling me in. It's actually in relation to, just very briefly, in relation to the same legislation about the, the smoke uh, detectors. Uh, a couple of months ago, after one of the, our security area committees, I contacted Scottish Fire Service asking just for advice about that. I very quickly got a response. I got uh, the local team came in and I qualifying in probably two categories, both being elderly and disabled, uh, they immediately fitted the, the system in my house. Uh, no, absolutely no mess at all. I was a bit uh, concerned initially when they mentioned it was a Wi-Fi system. My first thought was, 
what, well, if a fire, the Wi-Fi will probably go down, but I was quickly reassured that uh, it doesn't require your home Wi-Fi. It's, it is a radio, as I think Craig very briefly mentioned it, as a radio signal between each of the, the devices. So really, it's just to, to promote that. I totally agree with Willie. Uh, I've seen some uh, coverage in the press about it from the British government, but certainly not a lot. Uh, possibly because it's maybe not going to be the most popular of legislation when it comes along. But uh, thank you, anyway, Craig, and please pass it on to the local team. My appreciation. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fairbairn. Thanks, Chair. Morning, Craig. Morning. Thanks for a, a very comprehensive and precise report, as usual, and good to see that the uh, retained fire fire system is nearly 100% in the lockaway. That's very promising. Uh, going back to page 13, uh, 3.6 road safety, Craig, um, you mentioned working with schools. Now, I know for a fact that's happened now. Obviously, Nether Mill was attended by yourselves, and uh, Ian Anderson sent me a, a very comprehensive email on what went on that day, along with the council officers. So good to see that, and just congratulations, really, and thanks to all the officers that attended. Um, you'll probably hear more from me later on today because I've had several complaints in relation to primary schools today. So I think we can work forward with that again. That would be very good. Thanks very much, Craig. No problem. Thanks for your comments, and yeah, always willing to take that intel from the ground and see what we can do to support. Are there any other members' questions? No. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Craig, for your attendance today. And we'll go on to the recommendations. Members are asked to scrutinise the performance report for Dumfries and Galway from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in period 1, 1st April 2021 to 30th of September 2021, as detailed in the appendices. Is that agreed? Take it, silence is golden. Agreed, David. Thanks, Ian. Right, members, next item is Police Scotland and Police and Galway Local Plan six month performance update. 1st April 2021 to 30th September 2021, report by Head of Government and Assurance. Correction to the published papers. Please note that in Section 3, the current report refers to the 2017 to 2020 local policing plan and lists its priorities. The policing plan has since been superseded by the 2020 2023 local policing plan, which has the following priorities. Violent crime, disorder and antisocial behaviour, acquisitive crime, road safety and road crime, protecting vulnerable people and substance misuse. Chief Superintendent Cara Maguire of V Division is here to assist if members have any question on the local plant performance update from the previous six months from 1st April 2021 to 30 September 2021. Is there anything you'd like to add to the report, Carol? Hey. Just a couple of things, if that's okay, Chair, and, and thank you. It's good to be joining you all um, today to give you an update. Uh, the key information, as you say, is detailed within the report and hope it provides the committee uh, with some understanding of our, our um, um, policing activity and focus. Um, as Craig said, and I've mentioned before to meetings last year, I think we all know was a fairly unique one with the, the impact of COVID and the restrictions. And to some extent, that has continued um, into this year, particularly in relation to larger events in the nighttime economy, which has only started recently, really, um, to return to some normality. So it does make comparison of data a little bit less straightforward. Um, but there are just a couple of areas that I'd like to highlight that I'm sure you've all picked up on in any case. The first one um, relates to, to violent crime. And unfortunately, we've seen one murder and six attempt murders this year, which is just highly unusual um, for the region. Uh, those relate all to four separate isolated um, incidents. Um, the murder and four of the attempt murders are two separate incidents, both involving vehicles, and the remaining um, two attempt murders are domestic incidents. But um, thankfully, I'm able to confirm that, that the roles, those are all detective. On the positive side, when it comes to violent crime, we've seen a decrease in serious assaults um, with 33 this year compared to the, the three-year average of 41.7 and the five-year of 44.6. And again, a positive detection rate of 93.9%. 
Um, public protection matters, as you can see, there's been an increase in the number of sexual offences, in particularly indecent sexual assault, and over one third of those are, are non-recent. And hopefully that's an indication that the public confidence around reporting um, these crimes um, remains high, albeit clearly any report of such crimes is concerning to us and we'll continue to take that victim-centred approach. Uh, managing that risk and conducting a, a thorough and professional investigation. So inquiries into um, sexual offences can be protracted, so I'm hopeful that our detection rate will increase uh, in the coming months as we, we progress those inquiries um, in, in the coming weeks. Um, you'll also notice the drug supply cases, the detection rate appears to be particularly low, low at 67.5%, but I'm in anticipating considerable increase uh, in this as we receive the results from the laboratory that will then allow us to move those to detective cases and um, recent figures that I was given earlier this week would indicate that currently we're actually sitting at a detection rate of over 80 percent so it is moving uh, more into that to that positive detection rate that we would expect. Um, while not within this reporting period, I think it would be remiss of me not to mention COP26 and the um, the operation that, that obviously our local officers um, did support and a, a fairly um, um, significant proportion of our, our team down here in Dumfries and Galloway. The, the event went well with no um, issues really seen down in the region and, and we did manage to maintain that, that frontline uh, response, which is really positive. And thanks to, to our partners and to the um, committee members for your support through that, that period. So that was really the main areas I want to highlight. And obviously, I'm happy to take any questions that, that the committee members have, Chair. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I'll open this up. Any members' questions for Carol? Councillor Weaver. Thanks, Chair. You touched briefly on the uh, of uh, COVID, Carol. Could you just give us some more information on what cautions, um, etc., you have had to put in place in order to uh, deal with this, particularly in light of the uh, concern about the um, the new um, uh, strain uh, which has been detected. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've a, a division and a force. We've we've reviewed our C systems of work throughout the um the COVID pandemic and we've we've um We've varied theirs depending on, on the threat and risk. So obviously we're um, at a period where when it was at its peak where we were looking at non-attendance um, and, and dealing with more things um, virtually or by the telephone. We've clearly had all our officers um, with additional PPE, um, with full FFP3 um, face masks that everybody now um, or some months ago are now fully fitted for. So as, as we've been coming out of, of lockdown, um, then that PPE is kept reviewed. Um, obviously, we're, we're now back to attending calls where we are asking, obviously, the, the questions around is there any suspected cases um, or positives within a, a within a household, then we'll take the necessary precautions eh, and obviously we'll, we'll make sure that we're using that full PPE and that our officers are kitted up appropriately where they do have to go in and obviously we're still having to deal with, with crime and, and disorder and making arrests. We just make sure that where there is that increased threat, we've got the um, the additional uh, PPE um, and obviously going through our call centres and making sure that that threat and risk has been assessed so that we can have the appropriate response. hope that answers your question. Councillor. You happy yeah, that? Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Fairbairn. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Carol. That's very comprehensive report for fire. Um, I bet you had a question here, probably, actually, well, isn't it, isn't he? You've got, um, I'm trying to look through a small screen here, common assault on emergency workers is from, I think it's up to 119, 2020, 20, which obviously is totally unacceptable. Um, what's the kind of disposal in relation to that? You probably won't be able to tell me that actually, but I just wanted to kind of baseline what the disposal was if it went to the, the sheriff court. I don't have that information offhand. I, I can um, get that for you. What we certainly do is we've got the, um, you know, the, the partnership group in relation to um, assaults on emergency workers that we can, um, you know, take forward any, any learning 
jointly with a, with not just because it's not just police officers, albeit primarily, um, the majority of those will be police officers ordinarily um, at point of arrest, um, uh, or where we were um, where we're charging and taking enforcement action. But there are other um, partners and um, workers who are who are subject, unfortunately, to this behaviour. What I can say is we do have very positive support from the Crown of Office and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, locally to ensure that. Um, that robust action is taken. But in terms of what court they went to and what the outcomes are, I don't have that information, but if, I'll, I'll try to make. No, Carol, I really appreciate that. And like you say, obviously, the majority will probably be police officers and point of arrest. Absolutely, definitely. On, on the back of that, it probably ties in, actually. You've got um, page 44, number of allegations on duty, 2020-21. Obviously, we're living in non -present. Uh, times people just don't want to do as they're told. Um, so you've got 148, so it's up significantly. So I'd imagine that's probably down to the kind of situation we're in. People not want to kind of adhere to the rules. And I'd like to say that's reasonable people that are reporting those offences, you know, the allegations, but I don't know if you can run by anything or you can give any more on the back of that. About the police, it's, it, it, it can be very mixed. And, and where we do have I think say fractious um, incidents, it does normally um, result in a complaint about the police. I think there's a mix um, of of absolute genuine um, people concerned. Um, a lot of it around quality of service it, it, it can just be, um, you know, explained around our, our processes and procedures or the legislation that people um, don't understand. Um, and there is an element absolutely that people make that and that, that's great for them to do that and it's our professional standards that provide that independent inquiry um, or perk if it's a, of a criminal um, nature. Obviously we get fed back into the division, uh, not only the individuals if there's any learning points but if there's anything we need to take forward in terms of um, education either for ourselves or for communities then we'll, we'll take that forward. Thanks Carol. Chair, just if that's okay, is that right? Um, it was just really in relation to driving offences, Carl. Uh, obviously, I know that Campbell's retired, I believe, uh, and it was in the back of um, the conversation with Craig in the no primary and various other primaries. I just want to thank us for doing a really good job there, actually. It was a very positive day. But I will say that I've noticed myself that driving standards on the roads have slipped considerably since lockdown, I, I think, on a, on a daily basis. I'm witnessing some pretty poor driving. So, yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks, Carl. Are there any other members' questions? Carol, can I ask you a question? It's kind of <laughs> deviating away from it. Oh, Brett, Councillor Scrobby, I'll let you come in first then. Maybe I'm happy to give way to you. <laughs> no, no, well, I'll let you go on. I'll no fight you for it, Davy. Uh, Carl, I and, and, and you refer to uh, robberies, and, and unfortunately, I think there were two serious robberies in uh, Ward 1 where a weapon was involved uh, of late one not long after the other. Uh, I'm pleased to, to, to report that, that uh, the local police kept, or the police kept local members aware uh, of the incident and, and we have got that uh, rapport with the port of police at the, the, the local level. But it's really around uh, Two issues, and, and it's really to ask you in terms of your, where police see priority uh, and knowing that the police are already stretched. And that's around antisocial behaviour and the reporting of uh, where the, the, it's neighbours complaining about one another. It's really just where you see that fitting into the policing and the, the priorities. Uh, whether there's an increase or a decrease and how you are dealing with that. And also to the question that's continually asked of, of me as a member, and that's on-street parking. And I know it will be well down the list of, of, of priorities, but it's constantly asked and it falls to the responsibility of the police in terms of the enforcement until the legislation's through uh, in regards to uh, decriminalising of parking. Where do you stand on, on both these issues of antisocial behaviour reporting uh, uh, and responding? 
uh, an on-street parking uh, response in priorities? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll start with your first point. Um, Antisocial um, behaviour um, is one of our priorities, fully understanding on how that um, can have a, a particularly negative impact um, on communities or even just, as you say, uh, more more closely confined um, if it's if it's just linked to neighbours. So um, absolutely, we, we'll have our, our community teams looking at um, where we have problematic individuals where we have problematic areas and, and I certainly ask that we that we put um, plans and, and action plans. Uh, we work with um, partners to put in support where we've got it, it more local and, and, and neighbour um, related um, to try and prevent uh, and de-escalate situations um, before um, before they 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 get um, a too significant an impact on the uh, on the people that are involved in the wider community. So absolutely, see antisocial behaviour as part of our priorities and part of the the police plan. Uh, coming to your second point, parking, um, yeah, it, it it does become absolutely it's lower down. Um, uh, in our priorities that, that we have to focus on where the, the greatest um, threat and risk is um, to the community. Um, so now we are, we're looking at something that, that's um, dangerous, that's a, a risk to public safety and, and, and you know, impacts on that, that road harm and, and road crime, uh, absolutely. But if it's just um, uh, on street, on street parking offences, then we will try and deal with it where we can. But I have to be honest, and it is um, lower down on that threat of risk, so other priorities will take precedence. That, that being the case, Carl, and, and, and it's constantly being raised, how do we deal with the issue? Because it is a police issue in terms of enforcement, uh, and yet it, you know, it's pointed back to, 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 to the council, to members. Well, what are you doing about it, and, and, and so forth? How do we deal with the issue uh, without giving uh, the, the, the right to people to park anywhere and, and for any length of time, particularly to town centres? Sorry, you cut off halfway through there, um, um, Councillor. I, I think you were asking how we, how we, we can work to, to deal with this. Is that correct? Yeah, because it comes back to, you know, no matter when somebody raises it with me, uh, they kind of get to their shop to unload the, 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 their goods, uh, or it's somebody that kind of get parked on the street uh, in, in town centre, and, and, and they seem to think it's, it's a council issue, but the enforcement lies with the police. Uh, how do we deal with that issue without giving people the right to park where they want and for as long as they want? in town centres? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we will try and, um, you know, I suppose it's around around education. It's, it's trying to get um, people to adhere to the um, to the regulations that are in place. I think there's, there's an opportunity like in, in, in other Okay. Is there any other members who are not come in? No. Tell you what it is, Carol. We're, we'll probably not have another police fire and rescue meeting because of the new council coming in. I phoned 101 about six weeks ago on a Saturday morning. I came out of the town and there was a loose horse in the road and the pavement and the grass verge. I phoned, I tried to phone Castle Douglas and it just ran out. Phoned 101 after about 10 minutes on the phone with all the details. I said to him about phoning. Castle Douglas always said they can't phone your local office. Is that true? Another thing that kind of peeved me was they had me the decency to phone back to let me know that they sent somebody out. We actually got the horse collected after half an hour. The owners came and got it, but not, not one person got back on the phone to say they'd, they went out to the call or nothing. I find that a wee bit annoying. Yeah, I, I, I apologise um, for that. That councillor's um, stit. It always is um, good where we can to give people updates, but um, 
I'd be lying if I'd said we were always able to do that. Yes, we asked the public to contact, obviously, 999 if it's emergency. Uh, or Um, pick up the um, the telephone. This, as you know, has um, come up before. It's absolutely monitored and reported on in terms of um, response times for um, 101. Um, uh, and I know that actually even the, the Chief Constable had reported that, that himself in recent months um, to the SPA. We're still looking um, roughly, if you bear with me, I'll look at the, the most recent um, figures um, of an average um, call time and time in the most published uh, document is still three minutes twenty five seconds average for one o one. But we are aware that there are there are absolutely individual circumstances for that to be an average that that is over that. So uh, our command uh, contact command and control division uh, divisional commander is continuing to look at that. Hopefully, again, as we're coming out of COVID and some of the restrictions within the, the call centres in terms of social distances, some of the absences, um, we'll start to see that figure coming back down and hopefully we'll get less reports of those um, of those uh, lengthier time scales and on contact in 101. Thanks, Carol. Is there any other members' questions? I'd like to thank you for your attendance here today, Carol. Members, are asked to scrutinise the performance report for Dumfries and Galway from Police Scotland for the period 1st April 2021 to 30 September 2021 as detailed in the appendix. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Carol. Thank well, you. Item 6, I have not been notified of any other urgent business, so I'd like to thank all members for their attendance today. Thank you. Tuesday.